Okay, we, we talk about, we are in statistics and we talk about discrete distributions. Um, yeah, we have density functions um, and yeah, maybe we start here. Um, ah, da haben wir doch auch noch einen Zeigestock. Okay, the function which assigns a probability value to uh, each value of a random variable x is called the discrete density function of x. And now if we sum up all values of the probability density function, all values xi less than or equal to some value x, then the resulting function is called the distribution function. If we sum up all values, all values, so the, if we sum up the probabilities for all values of our random variable, what will then be the result? One, yes. So this is, a, this is a monotonic function which starts with zero at minus infinity and which ends uh, with the value of one for uh, plus infinity. Okay, sometimes it's also called the cumulative uh, distribution function. Um, now we define the expected value this is it. It's the sum over xi pi. Um, yeah, so what is that? We sum, uh, just forget for a second the, the, this pi. Then it would be the sum of all values of our random variable. Um, and now here it's a weighted sum. All values are weighted by their probabilities. And that's, yeah, finally, um, we get something a little bit related to the mean. Huh? If we forget the pi again, the sum of xi, if we divide this sum by the number of measurements, then we have the arithmetic mean. Huh? And these pi, they are smaller than one, so they are and if they are all equal, all identical, then, they are, then you have the same thing as 1 over n. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe we write it down here. Um, if we have some i equal 1 to n xi times pi, and if the pi are all identical, then, I mean, the sum over i equal 1 to n of pi has to be 1. And if they are all identical, then this whole thing is n times pi, which is 1, and then pi, they are all equal to 1 over n. Okay, so if they are all identical, then they are all equal to 1 over n. So then this is 1 over n times some i equal 1 to n xi. So you see there is a relation between uh, the arithmetic mean and the expected value. Um, yeah, this is true for the case where we have n values, which is a finite number of values. If the number of values is infinite, then we can't do this anymore. Okay, that's the expected value. And then we have the variance, which is the sum over xi minus the expected value squared 
And this again weighted with the probability. And the square root of the variance is the standard deviation. And this, this whole thing here reminds us of what we have seen a week ago. Uh, there we had the definition of the mean, the um, empirical variance, and the empirical standard deviation. And now I ask you, what is the difference between the expected value and the mean? What's the difference between these two guys? Are these just different terms for the same thing? Yeah, let's look at an example. Oh, again, I forgot my, uh, to bring the dice. Yeah? But you can imagine you all know what it is. What is the expected value uh, of an ordinary dice? 1 by 6. Hmm? 1 by 6. 1 over 6? No. Not at all. What you, what you said is the probability for having one of these six numbers as an outcome. This is 1 over 6, but the x. So you see this, this 1 over 6 occurs here, but this is not the result. What's the expected value for rolling a dice? Oh, that wouldn't be good if you play Mensch Alker dich nicht and you always had a one. No, the, the, the expected value, as you can see, is one number, not any number. It's one number. Yes, it is 3.5. It's the middle of the range of all the values. But I mean, now this is one um, exercise for you. Please do this little computation and uh, try to get this uh, 3.5 as a result. Huh? Um, okay. This is the expected value. Now, let me ask you, what is the mean in the dice game? What is the mean? 3.52? Yes, yes, perfect. We should have some data. But what kind of data should we have? Like the number of times we throw it. Yeah. That's the point, thank you. A number of times we roll the dice. Yeah? And that's the difference. The expected value tells us what we would get if we were able to roll our dice infinitely often. Yeah? So that's the limit for n towards infinity. But now in this real world, we are always only able to roll it a couple of times, let's say 100 times. Yeah? And then we would, uh, we would just sum up all, our, all the results and divide it by 100. That gives us the mean. And um, most of the time, it wouldn't be 3.5. It would be 3.39 or 3.57, whatever. Yeah? Something close to 3.5. But not always. I mean, if you roll your dice only three times, your mean might be 2. 
or 5 or 4.7, whatever. So it depends. It depends on how often you repeat your experiment, how good your mean is an approximation of the expected value. No? I mean, that's, that's all about statistics. In statistics, uh, one of the major tasks of statistics is estimation. To estimate, for example, an expected value. And a mean is an estimator for the expected value. No? And we will see in a few minutes the mean is the better an estimator the more experiments we make. I mean this is not surprising but what would be nice would be if we would have an idea about how good our estimator is. Do you know how good it is if you roll your dice ten times? What is the, the error you make? Or how good is it if you do it uh, 100 times? How much better is it to roll the dice 100 times as compared to 10 times? Is it worth taking this 10 times more effort? And that's a question we will answer today. Um, now let's talk about the variance. The variance um, gives... Uh, now let's talk about the standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance. I like the st standard deviation much more, because I already told you last time. What's the advantage of the standard deviation to the variance? Dimensions. Dimension is one, is one advantage, yes. Dimension first, and uh, second also the, the order of magnitude. Huh? Um, so the, the, the standard deviation is, as, as it, uh, the, this name already says, it's the kind of the average deviation of my measurement from the expected value. Huh? Look, I mean that's what you see here. Xi minus the expected value. It's the difference between my measurements and the expected value. Okay, now it is squared and weighted. Huh? And because of this square, um, the variance gives a, a too big a value. And that's why we take the square root uh, afterwards. Okay, let's continue. Yeah, let's look at a, a few uh, very popular distributions. Um, so first we talk about discrete distributions. Yeah, let's talk about soccer. Um, we do penalty kicking, and uh, I guess a good, a good uh, penalty kicker uh, has a probability of 0.9 to score a goal whenever he or she kicks a penalty. Huh? 0.9. So that means on average 9 out of 10 kicks will be a goal. Okay, and now we ask, um, for example, what is the probability if this kicker does 10 kicks? What's the probability to score 10 goals? If his probability for each individual kick to be a goal is 0.9. Huh? Okay, yeah, I mean, that's simple. Uh, it is simple under the assumption that all these 10 kicks are statistically independent. I mean, if this guy gets tired after kick number 5, then they are no longer independent. Huh? So we assume they are independent and then, do you remember what's the definition of two random variables to be independent? I mean, this answer must be immediately there. What's the same? Uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, uh, what's the definition of independence of, of two random variables? 
Hmm? P of A given B. Is probability of A. Yeah, is P of A. Yes. Thank you very much. That makes me happy. Yeah? Okay. But that's actually not the formula I wanted to see. Yeah? Um, but now, what is the definition of P of A given B? Yeah. Yes, divided by P of B. Okay. And now see, you see on the left hand side we have here the, uh, twice the same thing. So we can put this equal to this here. P of A. Okay. So that was easy. And now we bring this to the right hand side and now we have P of A and B is equal to P of A times P of B. You have to know this uh, by heart. Okay, and now back to our kicker. All the 10 kicks are statistically independent. So now the probability for kick number one to be a goal and kick number two to be a goal and number three and so on is just a product of all the individual probabilities which is 0.9 to the power 10. Okay? And the result is 0.35. Okay, um, and now we look at the probability for this player to, for what? Oh yeah, so it, it does 10 kicks, he does 10 kicks again, but now he scores only one goal out of 10 kicks. And the question is, is this normal? No, that's not normal. The probability for such a combination is very small. It is this. I mean, it's 0 0.1 uh, to the power 9 because 9 times he does not score a goal and one of these 10 kicks is a goal. So this is the probability for 9 misses and this the probability for one goal. Yeah? And of course, because these uh, 10 kicks are independent again, we multiply them. But now there is this factor 10 here. What's that good for? Oh, this is actually missing in the, in the script, so please uh, correct it. Yeah? Number of kicks? That's true, but why don't we have a 10 here? This was also the number of kicks here. Why, why, why is there no 10 here, but here? Why? It's true. Why? <laughs> because there, there are ten, 10 tries to do it. And each try has a probability of 0 0.1 to pay. Um, no, I mean, look at, at the, the other example. There are, he, the, the kicker also had 10 tries. 10 kicks? No, they are still all independent. There are ten ways to score on the goal. You can uh, score in the first goal and score in the second. Yes, yes. I mean, if we omit the ten here, then what we have here is... <coughs> so we have ten subsequent kicks. The probability for kick number one to miss is 0.1. 
times 0.1 for the second and so on. Um, so this is the probability for the first nine kicks to miss. Okay? Times the probability for the last kick to score the goal. So without the 10, this was the probability for exactly this sequence. But now it may happen that this kicker scores the goal with the first kick. And this is the same number, and for the second and so on. So you see we have 10 chances for, having, for getting this probability, and that's why we multiply it by 10. And now you understand, understood the binomial distribution. I mean, the binomial distribution is exactly what we have here. Just written a little bit more complicated. Yeah? So if we have an, um, a binary event with a probability of p, this p was um, 0.9 up here. Then we have the p to the power x times 1 minus p to the power n minus x. Huh? Look, p was 0.9 and x was 1 to score one goal out of 10 kicks. One goal out of 10 kicks. So we get p to the power 1 times 1 minus p to the power 9. That's what we had here. And here in front, we have the binomial coefficient uh, n over x. And what is a binomial coefficient n over x? Uh, this gives us um, the number of subsets with x elements out of a set with n elements. Yeah? So, uh, let's talk about the kicking again. We have kicks number. Kick number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And now here in our example, we asked ourselves how many chances are there to, uh, to miss all kicks but one. I mean there is this chance or this chance and so on. So we have ten chances. But now if we ask how many chances do we have to score two goals out of ten kicks, then we have to ask how many combinations are there to underline two of these numbers? Maybe these two. And that's the number of subsets with two elements, like that, out of a set with ten elements. And that's the binomial coefficient. I mean, that's elementary uh, combinatorics. Um, if this is new for you, just repeat it, read it. Okay, and that's the binomial distribution. Now we can look at graphs of this binomial distribution. Um, <coughs> yeah, le yeah, let me see. Um, <coughs> so this argument is x. Yeah? The, the binomial distribution has one argument which is x and two parameters. The first parameter is the number of kicks I do, and p is the probability for, the, for each one kick to be successful. And now in this graph, uh, here we have p of x, 10 kicks, probability 0 0.9. Yeah? And this is our density function. So you see the maximum is at 9. So if somebody if uh, asks you before the kicker starts with his 10 penalty kicks, 
how many uh, goals will this guy score? And I tell you before, the probability for this guy to score a goal is 0.9. And then, what would you say, how many goals uh, will, it, will it have? You would say 9, of course. Why would you say 9? Because it's the maximum of our binomial distribution. Yeah, but um, I mean a different question, a different question is what is the expected value of the number of goals this guy will score? If there are 10 kicks, then here we have the formula for the expected value the result is n times p. 10 times 0.9 is 9. And that's, that's quite interesting. So here, the maximum and the expected value are at the same place. I mean, that, uh, that occurs sometimes for some distributions, but not always. Okay, and you also see this distribution is uh, not symmetric, whereas this one here is symmetric. Um, this is, so 10 kicks and probability of 0.5. Uh, and the symmetry is due to the 0.5. Okay, there is a formula for the variance too. Um, yeah. Now we have the hypergeometric distribution. This is very important for you if you are playing Lotto every Saturday or Wednesday. Huh? Um, so we, th this is like such a um, urn experiment where you draw balls. Huh? And we have in our box, what do we have? Black and white balls. Yeah. And uh, so we have n balls in the box. K of them are white or black. K of them are black and the others are white. Yeah. Um, and now we draw um, lowercase n, little n balls. Yeah. And the probability to draw x black balls is this here. Or is Lotto better for you? What would you prefer? Drawing balls or playing Lotto? Lotto. Yeah. You can win more. Yeah? 14 million. No, uh, 1 over 14 million is the chance which is extremely small. But uh, if the checkpot is high, you may even win more than 40 million. Huh? But I can tell you, don't play, don't play Lotto. It doesn't pay off on average. OK, now, um, so this capital K is 49 now. So there are 49 numbers. Um, and the, now the probability for getting a 5, for example, in Lotto, uh, you, you compute the number of 5, um, five tuples out of 49 numbers. Uh, the number of different 5 tuples out of 49 numbers that's what you have here. So let's, yeah, let's, let's uh, write down the, the numbers. Um, so that would be H49, um, 6, comma, let's say 5. So this is playing Lotto and the probability for having a 5. 
And then we have 49 over uh, 5 times, and here we have 49 minus 6, which is 43, over n minus x. So n is, uh, let me see. Oh no, sorry, I, I forgot something of x is equal, let me see. I have got a question. When drawing n balls, <laughs> yeah? K6, K6, K6. N is 49, K6. Yeah, that's what I said, K6. Uh, but uh, in the formula, K is uh, 49, N is 49, N. Oh, yes, uh, uh, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, this was wrong here. That must be 6. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And here we have n minus x. <coughs> yeah, now I'm confused. Um, That's what we do in Lotto, okay? Okay, so I guess we have to draw the, the Lotto field. So there is 7 times 7. 7. 7. Okay. So now, you make uh, six crosses. I guess you make it like that. Okay? So that's what I do every week. Huh? So this is the, what is it? To draw X black. That's our n. And now when there is the lottery on, on Saturday evening, they draw six numbers, like these. Yeah. So you see in lotto you have two times the six. The six that you choose and the six there that are drawn in the lottery. And that's why we have uh, two times the six. I mean, you could have six and five if you could uh, choose six and they would draw only five. That would also be possible, but they don't do it like that. Okay, now let's continue with playing lotto. N minus X. Um, yeah, so 6 minus x divided by n is 49 over n is 6. Yeah. So this guy down here is about 14 million. That's the number of uh, possibilities to choose 6 out of 49 elements. That's this number. Then we 
get the five? Oh, x, this is x, sorry. Of course, this is x. Thank you. I mean, this x is the number of correct uh, um, selections, which would be one here. Yeah? What if I want to? If you want to have a three, then this tells you uh, what's the probability to get a three. Huh? A three? I want three of them correct. No, no, three of them correct. The number three is not relevant. Huh? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I could now start explaining all these details. I mean, it's just a matter of um, n choose k. Yeah? And that's a hypergeometric distribution, and the graph, <coughs> one dimensional graph, look, looks like that. If we fix all parameters and um, yeah, take our x here, and this is two dimensional with a, an, a variable n. Yeah, I don't want to uh, go too much into the detail. Yeah. How do we solve what? Solve what? There is nothing to solve here. I mean, you, you want to know how, how you compute the, all this. Uh, you go into your uh, elementary analysis book and look up the formula for n over k. I, I can write it for you. n factorial um, times n minus k factorial divided by, is that correct? No, it's just the other way around. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Times k factorial. No, what? No. What, is that correct? No. Yeah, then tell me. Oh yes, yes, you're right. So in the in the uh, enumerator, we only have n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial. That's it, I guess. Um, yeah. And again, we don't prove this now. Huh? So this formula you use for this and this and that and then. Okay, now let's talk about continuous distributions. I mean, the whole thing is quite similar. We just replace our sums by integrals, um, and that's it. If we want to make it easy. If we want to make it uh, difficult, then already to understand what we have in this little definition, is a full semester of mass theory. What is mass theory in English? Measure theory or? And that's about uh, defining a Lebesgue integral and uh, talking about what the probability is, but we don't do that here. Okay, we have a continuous random variable. Um, if it's a subset of the real numbers, Huh? Um, and if the density function and the distribution function, um, if we have these equations, so capital F of X, that's how we typically uh, um, call the, the distribution function, and the semantics is that's the probability for our variable x having a value less than or equal to lowercase x. Yeah? And that's the integral from minus infinity to x over 
lowercase f of t dt. Um, and this f of t is the probability density. Yeah. And now, I mean, yeah, let's, let's draw such an example uh, picture. X. Um, suppose this is f of x. And when we have continuous distributions, um, then, you know, if we have continuous densities like this here, then the distribution is quite important. Why? Because the density S by itself is not really interesting. I mean, you might think that this is a P of X. But that's not true. Why is the density in the discrete world? The density is a probability. But in the continuous world, it is no longer a probability. Why? Look, let's take this x here. And this value would be 0 0.07 maybe. It is not true that this value x occurs with probability 0 0.07. What is the probability for this value x? The answer is quite easy, but it's not 0 0.07. It is zero. It's exactly zero. Why? One way infinity. One over infinity. Since it's continuous. Yeah, since it's continuous, because there are infinitely many values. I mean. What is 0 0.07 times infinity? It's infinity. But the sum of all values must be 1. Or in other words, the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity f of x dx has to be equal to 1. Huh? And I mean, this is an infinite range here. Huh? So what this is, it's the probability density. It's the probability density and that's it. And now uh, if we want to talk about probabilities, the probability for really measuring this value exactly, this value x, is zero. But we get a finite probability as soon as we take a finite interval. then the probability for observing a value in such an interval is equal to what? So I start writing P of um, X in the interval x comma x plus delta x is equal to what? The integral between x and x plus delta, delta x. Yes, that's it. That's it. Thank you. Integral from x to x plus delta x over the density function dx. And I mean, this really makes sense because you would, you would have no chance 
to observe this value x. But you will have a finite chance if the width of this interval is greater than zero. Okay. Yeah, and here we have two special cases of this here. Um, so if x goes towards minus infinity, then of course we get a zero and in the limit x towards infinity, which is then the integral over the whole real numbers, then it must be one. Okay, yeah, now as a the most famous example of a continuous distribution. We take, of course, the normal distribution. And I can tell you that, especially in computer science and even more especially in, in artificial intelligence and machine learning, we always use the normal distribution. <laughs> uh, and there is a simple reason. The reason is that um, there are two reasons. I don't know which one to say. <laughs> the one reason is that it's, it's mathematically just so nice. Yeah? Um, all other distributions are ugly compared to the uh, normal distribution mathematically. That's one reason. And the second reason is that sometimes, or maybe even often, nature behaves like a normal distribution. We will see in a few minutes um, how nature behaves like a normal distribution. Yeah? Okay, um, this is the definition of the one-dimensional normal distribution. And I mean, here we just talk about one dimensions. Next semester we will have uh, multi-dimensional normal distributions, but now only one-dimensional. So there is this one variable x, there is this parameter mu, mu which is the mean of the normal distribution. Um, and there is sigma which is the standard deviation. Um, and the graph uh, is that. So phi 0, 1. So the mean at 0 here and a standard deviation of 1 and then the graph is this one here. And maybe we should uh, we should really look at the standard deviation. Um, that's, that's mu minus one sigma. This is mu minus sigma. And this is mu plus sigma. And now let's try to draw it like that. Yeah. And if, we, if you take the integral, the area here uh, between, so in, in the interval of width 2 sigma, then this will be around 0.65. And if you take um, minus 2 sigma and plus 2 sigma, so which is this, then we have around 0.95 of the whole integral. So that means the probability that some normally distributed random variable is being observed in an interval uh, mu minus 2 sigma to mu plus 2 sigma is 95%, around 95%. Okay, yeah, and now we observe nature. Um, and nature is sometimes really inconvenient. You know, when I, uh, this evening, when I drive home with my bicycle, when I'm lucky, it takes me five minutes. But when I'm unlucky, it takes me seven minutes. And it all depends on this traffic light at the Linse, you know. Uh, uh, this traffic light is really boring because it may be red for two minutes. Uh, and when I start here, I don't know. 
I don't know whether it's green or red or in between. Yeah? Um, I mean, with the bicycle, you can uh, go onto the trottoir and then uh, push your bicycle, and then it's only 30 seconds and not two minutes. Uh, and it's deterministic all, all the time, 30 seconds. But suppose you, you ride the car. Yeah? Then you can't, you can't push your car uh, around the traffic light. Yeah. OK. Um, and what happens is, I mean, I did it for 200 days this year. I mean, one, one year has about 200 working days, and I made statistics every day when I uh, drove back home from here. And these were, uh, this is the distribution of waiting times. Huh? You see, between 0 and 120 seconds was my waiting time this year. Huh? And, um, and that's the frequency, how often I observed a certain waiting time. And again, I, I, I showed you last time when you, when you display such statistical results, then typically you do, you, um, so you, you, you take such little buckets where you put in all your measurements. So um, here we had uh, 40 such classes. Yeah? So that means uh, this is from 0 to 3 seconds, 3 to 6 seconds, and so on. So I had to wait between 0 and 3 seconds 7 times, uh, and between 3 and 6, 6 seconds 7 times, and so on. So that's the distribution I observed. Isn't that nice? You should do such statistics too. I mean, when you are at the traffic light and you're bored, just take out your sheet of paper and make a tick in the, in the respective class and at the end of the year you will have something like that. Yeah. And then, I mean, you can do statistics. You can, for example, compute the average value, the mean. And the mean for me this year was 60.1 six, five seconds. That's what I had to wait on average. Oh, that's quite interesting. So that means, I mean, 200 times 60 seconds. That's like 200 minutes. What's that? Three hours. Yeah, even more than three hours. Okay, but uh, I mean, I really want to know what happens next year. If I do the same statistics next year on 200 days, will my average waiting time be again 60.165 seconds? Or will it be 70 seconds? Or even 100 seconds? I mean, we would ask a little bit more precise. We would ask, what is the probability for an average waiting time of 100 seconds? That's what, what we would ask. Yeah? And yeah, we want to know the answer. But I mean, the probability, that's easy, isn't it? I mean, this is our empirical um, frequency. Now, uh, I mean, if I would have done even more measurements, then these uh, random fluctuations would be smaller and we would get a uniform distribution, okay? So all waiting times on average have the same probability. The probability for, wait, for having to wait three seconds is the same as for having to wait 117 seconds. Huh? And it's the same for having to wait uh, 72 seconds. All the probabilities are the same. And I mean, here you again, you see the difference between empirical statistics, that's a frequency, and on the other side there is a probability. Yeah? I mean, you could, 
you could divide all these frequencies by 200 and then you would have the probability estimate, not the real probability. But what you can see from this is the probability uh, to observe any time is the same. You have a uniform distribution. Okay, but now then I can conclude that my average waiting time next year may be 115 seconds as well as 60 seconds as well as um, 10 seconds. Yeah? I hope you do not agree with that. Of course not. My average waiting time is something different. Huh? That is something different. And you know what? I wanted to really know what the average waiting time is next year. And you know what I did? That's what I did last year, not this year. Huh? Last year, I asked, I, here at the Fachhochschule, we now have about 200 employees. And I took these all 200 employees last year and I asked them to every day drive back home to my home and then after that they can go home to their home. Huh? And they all had to stop at the traffic light uh, across the Lindsay. Huh? And they all had to do this 200 times. Okay, because I wanted to know what is the average uh, waiting time? So, and if I want to do statistics about the average waiting time, I have to repeat my 200 measurements 200 times. So that 200 times 200 gives something like 40,000. Huh? So we all employees from the Fachhochschule had to wait 40,000 times at the traffic lights at the Linse. And now the question is, what is the result? And here it is. That's what we got. So employee number one had an average waiting time of 51 seconds. Employee number two had this and so on. Oh no, sorry, these are only Again, uh, I think that these are 40 classes again. No, 20, 20 classes. Okay, so 10, 10 employees had a waiting time in this interval. Another, uh, no, uh, I mean, yeah, these are, these are the probabilities for, um, let me see, yeah, for 10 out of these 200, yeah. What you can see is that around 60 we have the maximum. This is the empirical density for the average waiting time. Yeah? Each one of these two points, of, of these points, corresponds to 200 measured waiting times. And it is the average over 200 waiting times. Okay? So now, again, these are the individual measurements. And this is the average of 200 measurements. And we get a different distribution, which is much smaller and it's peaked around uh, the expected value.
Yeah, and the question is, do we know something, for example, about the standard deviation for uh, the standard deviation of this new random variable, which is the mean? Huh? Again, so there is this random variable T, capital T. Oh, sorry, this should be a T, a T bar, yeah? of course. So this is the, the, um, the average here, which would be there 60 something. Yeah, here we have the T bar. And how is this new random variable defined? How is this new variable defined? T bar is equal to um, 200 measurements, 1 over 200. That's it, yeah? So it's the sum of 200 independent random variables. <coughs> and these 200 independent random, random variables, they're all drawn from the same distribution, hopefully they don't change the intervals on this traffic light uh, across the Linse. Yeah? Only then they are uh, identically distributed and independently. Yeah? That's important. I mean, if you read texts, they al always write I, I, D variables. Independent, identically distributed random variables. Yeah? identically distributed. That does not mean the variables have to be uniform. That's not important. No matter how they are distributed, they just need to buy, be identically. So my first stop at the traffic light um, must be drawn from the same distribution as the second stop and so on. Okay. Now why is, why is this distribution uh, uh, so peaked? Can you give some intuitive argument? Excuse me? The value average value is 60.125, so the peak will be near the middle. The peak will be near to 60. Yeah. Yes, but why? The average of 1% the average of 1%. 1 per cent. One person. One person. Yes, the average is 60. That's what we know. Yes. But we are now talking about the distribution of the average. The average, that's the point. The average, the average is a statistical, a new random variable. Huh? And this new random variable is much more sharply peaked as my original random variable. I mean, the original random variable um, is the distribution of my original random variable would look like um, something like this. 
look, we, we, we are here, we only have between 50 and 70. So it really goes from 0 to 120. Huh? So if you, yeah, I mean, between 50 and 68. Um, now let's go back here. So our, our distribution we had there was something like this. if we draw it here. It's extremely high and extremely small. Why is this? Because we do 200 measurements and the probability that all our 200 measurements lie here is extremely small and the probability that they are all here is extremely small too. That's it. Okay, and here comes the mathematics. That's the central limit theorem. That tells you what nature does if you do many measurements. And nature gives you as a result a normal distribution if you have enough patience. Okay, so if we have independent, identically distributed IID random variables with <coughs> a sigma square, which is a standard deviation that's greater than zero uh, oh, the variance greater than zero and uh, less than infinity. And now, look, we are now talking about the sum of these n random variables. Um, and um, We could also define a new variable x bar as 1 over n times Sn, which is 1 over n times um, x1 plus xn. So you see, of course, the sum is closely related to, uh, to the mean. Huh? They, they just differ by this factor 1 over n. Huh? So this central limit theorem talks about the sum of n independent variables and when we divide the result by n then we have the same then we can apply this theorem to the to the mean. Then Sn strives towards a normal distribution for n towards infinity with the expected value n times E of x1. Now, can you understand this? Can you transfer this to our traffic light example? Expected value is 60 seconds. And now I did this whole thing 200 times last year, and now this says the expected value is. 200 times 60 seconds, which is 200 minutes. No, we are, we are not talking about the expected value for our waiting time. We are talking about the sum of all the waiting times, which was the overall waiting time last year, and the overall waiting time was something like 200 minutes. Okay, we are talking about the sum, and now the, I mean, this is not surprising. The expected value um, of the sum is n times the expected value of each variable. Yeah? So if I take this variable n times, then the expected value is n times the original expected value. This is not surprising at all, and that's not the reason why I show you this theorem. The interesting thing is the variance is n times sigma squared. 
And that's surprising. At least if you see this for the first time. Why is it surprising? Because as soon as we look at the variance, uh, no, if, as soon as we look at the standard deviation, then that's kind of interesting. Our, let's call it sigma n. This is the standard deviation for this new variable Sn. Okay? And this sigma n is the square root of, what is it called? Um, yeah, let's call it var n, which is square root of n times sigma squared. The variance is n times sigma squared. That's what we read here. And now look, this is square root of n times sigma. And that's very important and very interesting. So for our summation variable, the um, expected value is n times the original expected value. So 200 times weighting at the Lindsay and summing it all up means on average I have to wait 200 times as long. But good news is I can predict the overall waiting time much better because the standard deviation does not grow linearly. So the standard deviation is not 200 times as big as the original standard deviation. It's only square root of 200 times. What's the square root of 200? Oh, it's 14 point something. Yeah? So the standard deviation is only 14 times as big as the standard deviation that it was originally. And that's the reason why here this standard deviation is so small. Okay, so this was the first part of this theorem. Now comes the second part, um, which gives us even more interesting information. This is the limit for n towards infinity. So this I mean, the whole thing holds only for n towards infinity. So if I make only three measurements, we have to be careful. Huh? But 200 is a little bit towards infinity, okay? Um, so for n towards infinity, the supremum, supremum is, I mean, for today, you may replace it by the maximum. Huh? But from tomorrow on, you would call this the least upper bound. Okay, so we take something like the maximum of this. Now what do we have here? Sn of x. Sn is our summation variable. So this is our, our, the distribution of our sum, summation variable minus, that's a function, yeah, that's just a function, um, the density function of the sum of all these variables. And now what do we have here? This is phi, and phi is the normal distribution. The normal distribution with this mean, n times expected value, look, this is the mean of our new variable. And this is the new standard deviation, square root of n times sigma of x. So we have, here we have the difference of two functions. The difference of our summation variable minus the normal distribution. And that's really interesting. That's interesting. 
And this difference goes to zero for n towards infinity. So that means, I mean, think of what we talked about in, with the Taylor series. We also had a limit for the difference of two functions. So that means for n towards infinity, the distribution of our summation variable converges to the normal distribution. And that's why this here, this bell-shaped uh, distribution is similar to a normal distribution. It is not a normal distribution, but for n towards infinity, this gets closer and closer to the normal distribution. And this is, I mean, when I read this the first time, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Because no matter how your original distribution looks like. So your original distribution of waiting times, I don't know how your traffic light uh, back home in India or wherever uh, works. Huh? Maybe the distribution in India is, I don't know, maybe they are much better, so it, uh, that would be nice. Wouldn't it be good? So most of the time you would have to wait only one second and uh, very seldom only a, a long time. It may be like that or it may be like that. It doesn't matter. As soon as you do many measurements, it will be a normal distribution. That's nature. Isn't that nature? I mean, that's even, even more than nature because it's mathematics. That even holds on on planets where there is only, uh, only nitrogen and no oxygen or whatever. Yeah? It doesn't depend on animals and plants and that's just universal truth. I never understood the proof of this theorem. I actually never looked into it. But I guess it's not so easy. There are many proofs of this, that's uh, what I know. But I, uh, we all should read the proof because it's such a beautiful theorem. Huh? Maybe the proof is not so beautiful, I don't know. Okay, this theorem implicates, so I would say implies, uh, several Oh, I would even say this theorem has several important conclusions. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what we talked about long enough now. Um, yeah, the mean value from n independent measured var values of a random variable is approximately normally distributed. That's the kernel of this theorem. The mean has approximately a normal distribution. And the more measurements we make for the mean, the more the mean is normally distributed. Why is the mean normally distributed? Because this only talks about the sum. But what did I say? The mean, where, where, where is the mean? Here. The mean is only a constant factor times the sum. So if the sum is normally distributed, then of course the mean is also normally distributed. Huh? Um, just the difference is a little is the following. Um, the mean is 1 over n. So if this is my sum variable, sum over xi here, and we do have this normal distribution for the sum variable, then for the mean, let's say if n is equal to 4, then, uh, no, let's say n equal 10. Then the mean is, 1 over 10 times this. So the whole thing will be squeezed by a factor of 10. 
So you, we will then have something like that, even higher up. No? But the shape will be a normal distribution again. Just the um, the variance is of course smaller. We divide the whole thing by n. Okay, yeah, we, we have to look at this now. And then we can finish. Um, yeah. So the this is the standard deviation of our summation variable. Okay, and now the how should we call it the sigma n of the mean is equal to 1 over n times square root of n times our original sigma. And this is 1 over square root of n times our original sigma. And this now is, a, is uh, really important for you as an engineer when you make measurements. When you want to know the average waiting time of the Linse traffic light, huh? uh, then you already, before you make your measurements, you can predict the standard deviation of the mean. If you know the standard deviation of the traffic light, you just multiply it by 1 over square root of n. So if you make 200 measurements, then, so sigma uh, 200 of the mean is equal to 1 over 14.1 something times the original sigma. Or let's take sigma 100 of the mean is one tenth of the original sigma. So in order to get a factor 10 more accuracy, how many measurements do you need? 100. You need 100 measurements and then your results are by a factor of 10 better. If you do averaging. Yeah, and that's why this is so important for all empirical sciences. I mean, that, that's a kind of a bad news because the effort grow, grows quadratically with the gain you have. So if you want to have a factor of 100 more on accuracy, and the factor of 100 is not too much, it's just two more decimal places, you would have to make 10,000 measurements. Yeah, so that's what we learned about nature today. Thank you.